The Adventures of Frank Race, starring Tom Collins. The war changed many things, the face of the earth and the people on it. Before the war, Frank Race worked as an attorney, but he traded his law books for the cloak and dagger of the OSS. And when it was over, his former life was over too. Adventure had become his business. The Adventures of Frank Race. Join Frank Grace for the adventure of Three on a Match. A rainy night in Bordeaux. It was late, and the chill had become as insistent as the tone of a nagging woman. But I didn't care. I was only a few seconds from the Bar de Brie, a hostel of good liquor and interesting patrons. Here I was to meet Mark Donovan, and... I stopped just short of the door. Someone was running toward me. I caught the figures of two men. One of them had been hit. He lurched into my arms. Let me go. Let me go. It's all right. It's all right. Here, let me help you. Come on. Come on. We better get inside the bar race. Mark. Come on, will you? Them people ain't kidding. Uh, That's Charles Borden you're propping up. Borden is Frank Race. Hello, hello, Race. Yeah, bullet. How badly you hurt? Well, if I, if, if I could just sit down, Here, I... there's a table race by the wall. Come on. Well, that tears it. What's the matter? They, they, they followed us in here. Oh, never mind. Just ease yourself into this chair. Thanks. Oh. Where are they? The other, the other end of the bar race. Three guys and the dame with a gun in her hand. Do you remember Bergman and Intermezzo? If you were a man, you thought of her as being everything a woman should be. Well, here was another one. The same honey-colored look, same expression about the eyes. The kind of woman to turn a man wistful and introspective. And she stood at the end of a bar with a gun in her hand. Some gal, all right? Who is she? I don't know. Well, looks as if we're going to find out. She's coming over here. What about that wound, Borden? Well, there's some pain, but I think I'm going to be all right. Uh, could I Could I have a cigarette? You're going to need a doctor. We'll get you to one as soon as you've had a rest. I will take a night off that, too. Three on one match? Are you superstitious? Only that it may burn my fingers. Here you are. Thank you. Would you mind if I sat down? Obviously, you're an exponent of the fait accompli. My name is Marie Vattel. It is my intention to take this man out of here. But why? What do you have against me? As if you did not know. Why don't you put that pistol away? You know, it could alarm people into calling the police. I'm not afraid of the police. I don't imagine you're afraid of anything. But strong-arm methods aren't going to get you anything here. Borden's been hurt. I'm going to see to it that he gets to a doctor without interference. I have three men with me. Each of them is thoroughly capable of this sort of thing. I shall give you about... 30 seconds to decide, but you should be sensible. She made every word she said, but I couldn't let her take Borden. The gun she'd laid on the table was the only weapon showing, and I sensed that this was the instant to make a play. I shifted my hands to the underside of the table and heaved. <laughs> Borden, get out of here! Race the girl, watch it! No! Better. Good. It's about time you come out of it. If I had my choice, I'd just as soon not. You've got a nasty clout on the sconce. How do you feel? No. Like a dying duck in a thunderstorm. What happened to Borden? Believe it or not, he got away. <laughs> you started quite a front again, you know? Yo. Seems as though every guy in the joint took it as a personal signal to start slugging the guy next to him. Where are we now? In the back room of the joint. I give the gendarmes quite a pitch about being innocent sightseeing Americans so they don't haul us in. Mm. <laughs> Want to get up? Yeah, I think I'd better give you a pull. Yeah. Yeah. 
Head pretty bad, huh? Yeah, I've had gear more carefree moments. I've got to get something straight, Marcus. So I'm going to try concentrating. What did you locate, Borden? Uh, one of them hotels on the list. The guy is scared, Race. That's why I left the Metropole without no forward and address. But he was willing to come and see him. Uh, when I told him who you was and that Acme indemnity had sent you over, he got downright eager. Mm. When were you jumping that girl and her boyfriends? Mm, three or four blocks from here. You know, I still don't get the reason for it. Do you? I haven't the slightest idea, Mark. But I'm going to do my best to find out. <laughs> George Seals, Paris representative of the Acme Indemnity Company, looked startled when I told him why I dropped into his office. Why, for Pete's sake, Ray's, do you mean that you don't know the story behind this affair? When Dan Carlson called me for the case, I'd been in New York just two hours after the flight from Trieste. He said I'd get the lowdown from Borden. Hmm. If Borden is coherent enough to give it to you, he was treasurer for the fund. What fund? European Children's Relief. Better than half a million pounds. You see, Borden had turned it over to a committee of three in London. The Countess d'Artois, Gilbert Evans, the diplomat, and Phil Gaynor, the American broker. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Who was to know that Gaynor had just gone broke and would embezzle the money? He produced the signatures of d'Artois and Evans for the full amount, signed it himself, and that was that. That's particularly pathetic because of the crop failures throughout the country. The kids are going to be in desperate need of that relief fund. Uh, do you know of a woman by the name of Marie Vartel? No, should I? In one way, yes, but... Uh... Probably better off the way you are. I'm going to Bordeaux and look for him. Marie Vartel. Eh? So you would like to know who she is, monsieur? Why? She's very beautiful. Does it seem unreasonable that a man should seek information about her? <laughs> Marie Vartel. Eh? Monsieur, men used to pray by that name in this country. Ah, then she must have been with the underground during the occupation. In Bordeaux, monsieur, Marie Vartel was the underground. Well, tell me, where can I find her? If I tried to tell you that, I would be wasting your time. I do not know, monsieur. It was the same way in other places. Many knew of Marie Vartel. None would say where she could be found. But finally, at the expense of 50 American dollars, I got the lead I wanted. You. It occurred to me, Miss Bartell, that I didn't think to mention my name the other night. Oh, your friend mentioned it during the fight. Mentioned it at the top of his voice. You are called Race. You don't seem at all surprised to see me. I gave up being surprised several years ago. <laughs> Won't you come in? Thank you. Marie Bartell. You must have been a pretty youthful member of the underground. I was 17. You've been asking questions. People talk because they seem fond of you. What did you want, Race? What made you shoot Charles Borden? What made me sh You're laughing at me. I'm completely serious. The next time I see him, Race, I intend to kill him. But why? Tell me why. Borden has been custodian of a fund subscribed by the people of your country for the children of Europe. He reported that it had been embezzled. The equivalent of two million of your dollars. Two million dollars intended for children. We fought for things like that during the war race. And I have information that Charles Borden has that money himself. In cash. It all shaped up as pretty much of a puzzle. My job is to get back that money. For the sake of Acme Indemnity and the kids of Western Europe. So I felt I was getting a definite break when Borden called me that afternoon. I've tried several times to get in touch with you, Race. I've been in Paris. How are you feeling? Oh, I'm doing all right. I've been under the care of a physician. And Borden, we uh, haven't had a chance to talk, but I wish you'd tell me if you know anything concerning the whereabouts of that money. Why, it's in London, Race. I sent it to my brother there. You? But I thought the money had been stolen. Well, it was stolen, but uh, I got it back. Hey, look, Borden, I, uh, I seem to be all mixed up about all this business. I'd uh, better see you and talk to you. The sooner the better, Race. I'd like to share my worries with you. Perhaps my safety. He gave me the address of a hotel nearby, and I went there at once. I found him in a dressing gown, his left arm in a sling. Been smoking a lot of cigarettes. Well, I got something new to fret about now. 
I have a feeling that someone listened in on our phone conversation just now. That could be rough on my brother. What about your brother? Well, he's Dr. Jonathan Borden. Perhaps you've heard of him. Yes, the uh, literary authority. Yeah, that's right. You see, he's in London doing a work on the life of Charles Dickens. I sent him the money simply because I had to get it off my hands. Borden, would you mind briefing me on something? If the money was embezzled, how did you happen to have it? Through a fluke. You see, I've been suspicious of Phil Gaynor. When he made his move, I was right behind him. I happened to catch up with him in a hotel room in Lyon. Or rather, I caught up with a bag containing the money. Mm -hmm. Gaynor had stepped out, so I just carried the bag away. Well, it's been like having a time bomb in your possession. All right. What do you want me to do? Race, six attempts on my life have been made in the past four days. I realize now that I may have placed Jonathan in the same position. And he isn't well. He was with the Marines in the South Pacific, and he suffered wounds that left his heart in pretty bad shape. I wish you'd go to London and take over. I'm worried about Jonathan. <laughs> London, I found Dr. Jonathan Borden in the midst of a puzzled mood and an upset flat. He stared at me when I mentioned the money. Half a million pounds. Then that explains this very cryptic note I received from Charles. Here, listen to what he wrote. Um, I'm sending you the money in charge of Dodie. For heaven's sake, take good care of it. What would he mean by that? I haven't received any money, and why would he do a thing like that? Why didn't he just turn it over to the French police? Well, I'm afraid your brother isn't in what we like to term a normal state of mind. Oh? He's been attacked and harassed continually for several days. He's been under drugs for a gunshot wound. Oh, yes, yes, I realize he's in trouble. That's why I'm packing to go to France. And I'd like you to go with me, Mr. Race. Dr. Borden and I reached Bordeaux late that night. There was no rain, but the city lay soggy in the grip of a heavy fog that had drifted in from the Atlantic. We went straight to Charles Borden's hotel. Funny, he doesn't answer. Was he usually a heavy sleeper? Well, not as a rule, but if he's been receiving drugs... Well, let's try the door. Well, he's asleep all right, but... I caught the impact of it at the same time. It was in the twist of Charles Borden's head, in the grotesque stretch of his body beneath the bedding. Charles Borden was dead. Someone had cut his throat. <laughs> We'll return to the adventures of Frank Race in just about one minute. And now, back to the adventures of Frank Race. Looking at what was left of Charles Borden suddenly left me weary and depressed. A man I had been trying to protect, murdered. Whatever the reasons, this was one kaleidoscope of crime that assumed too many shapes for me. I needed straightening out on it. So I went back to the offices of the Acme Indemnity in Paris and caught George Shields on the verge of taking a client to lunch. You know Gilbert Evans, don't you, Ray? No, we've never met, but I remember the name. You uh, served on the committee of the Children's Welfare Fund, didn't you, Mr. Evans? That's right. A very unfortunate business. I can't help being curious about something, Mr. Evans. Oh? How was it that Phil Gaynor was able to persuade you to sign that welfare fund check for such a large amount? I didn't sign anything. My name on that check was a downright forgery. I see. And how about the Countess d'Artois? Was her signature a forgery, too? Well, that I can't say. You might ask her. Emily, Countess d'Artois. She came down to greet me in a filmy something that looked as though it might decide to stop clinging at any moment. She was quite a dish, and well aware of it. I'm told you came to see me about Phil Gaynor. That's right. Do you know Phil? Not at all, but I'm doing my best to remedy the situation. You're an American. Yes. Does that destroy your illusion? <laughs> You'll do in any language. <laughs> You're quite direct, aren't you, Ace? Did Gaynor forge your name in that check, too? No. No, I signed it. I thought Phil was all right then. Is it important? Frankly, I don't know. You ask a question here and there, possibly you learn something. Or it may be a waste of time. And uh, in my case? No male would ever call you a waste of time. <laughs> well, that sounds like something we should drink to. What would you like? I'd say this atmosphere calls for absinthe. Well, I'm complimented. <laughs> 
I think I'll have the same. She had plenty of firepower. And the effect wasn't what you'd call unpleasant. The way she manipulated that figure had me making mental passes until the absinthe turned me into the physical type, at which point I reached for the woman. By the time I let go, in spite of the absinthe, I had this girl pretty well tabbed. Here was a surface that simmered, but with a core that operated at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Why do you look at me like that? I'm trying to figure your angle. <laughs> What's the matter, Ray? Suffering from an inferiority complex? No, let's not fret about me. I've been to market before and had buyers. But you know. You know, Race, I could like you. I could like you a lot. For myself alone. Have another drink, darling. You'll be happier without those suspicions. Yeah, maybe you're right. Guess we can have fun without being soulmates. For a while, anyway. You wouldn't feel gainer, weren't you uh, rather fond of each other? Should I say yes? What do you take me for? A jerk. Careful, Countess. Your past is showing. I suppose you can take him and leave him. That's right. Same way I feel about you. Mm, I don't think I'm going to be too badly hurt. Oh, you'll be back. If I were in the mood, I'd offer you big fat odds on that. It was almost as soon as I left her place that I got the feeling of being tailed. I went for a couple of blocks, and then as I was about to cross an intersection, a cab swung to a stop at the curb in front of me. You've had enough time for strolling. Get in. Sorry, my mother always taught me to refuse rides from strangers. Don't try being clever. Unless you want to start out with a split in your skull. He had no sense of humor. And since this condition went with a pair of eyes like lead pellets, I repressed an impulse to be flip. Besides, he had two other similar personalities with him. So I became a passenger and ended up in a cheerless-looking room over a vacant shop. Now, Ace, maybe you'd like to tell us where we can find that money, huh? And if I don't, I suppose we're going to play games. We can be friends if you want it that way. But friends do favors for each other, no? And what happens if I give you a fast, handsome answer that turns out to be a dud? You will still be here. We will merely come back and discuss it with you again. Well, who gave you the idea you could get this information out of me? Where's the money, Ace? Well, let's see now. What can I tell you to postpone this buffeting I am due to receive? After all, there's always a chance the cavalry might arrive. Maybe this will stir your thoughts. Well, yeah. looks like a railway express dump. So it is. We found it in your hotel room in Bordeaux, in the pockets of a jacket. I remembered it when he said that. I'd picked it up in Charles Borden's room while his brother and I had been waiting for the police. My lethargy had forgotten about it. Well, Ace? Well, didn't you check on it with the express office? Since we could not provide the name of the person to whom it had been issued, they would give us no information. Oh, could I say it? Mm. You mentioned my name, didn't you? Well, it should prove I had nothing to do with it. Not at all. You could have used another name? Yes, I could, couldn't I? All right. Where do we go from here? Where is that money, Ace? I sent it to London. So, you sent it to London. <coughs> oh. no. I will try again. We'll go on trying. Where's the money? There was only one way out for me. I gave him another snappy answer, and when he swung this time, I leaned into it. I came out of it looking into the brown eyes and honey-colored hair of Marie Bartel. I took a second or so to lick the dryness from my lips, and then managed to grin up at her. She smiled back at me. It was faint, but it was a smile. How do you feel, Race? You keep rough company, baby. All right, Race, on your feet. Let him alone, <clears throat> Menard. My instructions were for you to follow him. Nothing else. This is the faster way. Get up! Menard! One more bit of play like that, and I'll set your head to ringing with his pistol. You go too far, Marie. I should take that trinket away from you. So? And will you try it now? No. Then get out of here. Yeah. You have a way with it, baby. Yeah. Let me help you up. Uh, thanks. Maybe you have two ways with it. You aren't very big, are you? I don't like men to touch me, Reyes. Well, this is purely ingratitude, baby. And that was that ingratitude, too? I think it started out that way. You're free to go. 
If you'd like, Grace. Tell me something, Bruce. Hmm? You on the level with this Joan of Arc business? Joan of Arc? Oh. Or are you really after that money for yourself? What good would it be for me to say? All right. I can't understand why you don't concentrate on Philip Gaynor, the man who got away with the money in the first place. Gaynor is dead. Dead? How do you know? See for yourself. She handed me a piece of cut-out newspaper, dateline London, it was three days before. It told of the finding of the corpse of Philip Gaynor, a London businessman of American citizenship, and mentioned the details concerning his embezzlement of the welfare fund. According to the account, none of the money had been found on his body. You see, Rice? Yeah, I wish I did see him. Wonder how he died. I would say he was murdered. Wouldn't you? Oh, brother, what a whistle stop this Bordeaux. More fog than a three day hangover. And how's your noggin, by the way? Well, my headache's just about let up. I'll be okay. Two clouds inside of a week. Next time, how about ducking a little quicker? What'd you find out at the express office? Uh, I just mentioned the name Borden, and they told me all. But there was no door involved. Just a shipment of books. Hmm. That means something? Not at the moment. Maybe it's the condition of my head. Yeah. yeah. Oh, just a second. Here. Dr. Jonathan Borden. Oh, thanks. Hello, doctor. I called to see if you turned up anything, Race. Well, I wish I could say Yes. Everything seems to be just as muddled as before. Incidentally, did you uh, get some books that Charles sent you? Oh, yes, yes. They caught up with me this morning after going to London and back. A lovely centennial edition of Charles Dickens. Uh, any significance? If there is, I haven't sensed it. Oh, by the way, while I was out yesterday, I had a caller. A woman by the name of Vartel. Do you happen to know... Marie she... Vartel. You sound perturbed. A little. It occurs to me that we should get you back to London as soon as possible. <laughs> Vartel, the most provocative unknown quantity in the case. Marie Vartel. Marie Vartel. Come on, come on, Yo. come on, race. Yeah. Wake up, will yeah. you? Come on. Yeah. Hey, chum, time to go down for dinner. Come on. Yeah. I haven't been sleeping that long. You've been corking it off ever since that guy phoned. Yeah. Dr. Borden. Yeah, I remember said something about a set of books. Dickens. I wonder what... Mark. Yeah, yeah, what's the matter? Mark? Books. Dickens. I've got it. Come on. You know, raise the window a little higher, will you, Mark? Yeah. You know, chump... Gendarmes catch us doing is we are liable to spend no little amount of time in the Bastille. Well, it's too late to turn back now, ain't it? We have already broken and entered. Great. What next? I have a case of books on the table. Uh, somebody opened them for us. Looks as though they have already went through them. Find David Copperfield. Yeah, wait a minute. Let's see. David Copperfield, David Copperfield. Uh, yeah, here it is. If you're looking for daughter, ain't nothing in it. Look. I think you're repeating a mistake that was made before, Marcus. Being too hasty. Unless I'm very wrong, these... Yes. You see? This is one of those editions where the pages have to be slit. So slit? Yeah. There we are. A brand new thousand-pound note. Holy cow. Look, the book is loaded with them. I thought I heard someone in this room. I hope you'll forgive us, but we're rather anxious to check this the little money. matter. You found the money? Yes. Now we must see that it gets to the proper authorities. Well, naturally, I'll take care of that. Why should you? Well, for one thing, it's in my possession. I also happen to be Charles Borden's brother. As my friend here would say, in a pig's eye you are. What do you mean? If you were Dr. Jonathan Borden, you'd be an authority on Charles Dickens. As such, you'd have known what Charles Borden meant when he mentioned Dodie. That happens to be the pet name David Copperfield's first wife had for him. No, you're not Dr. Borden, but you're his killer. You moved in and murdered him when you learned he was being given custody of the money. You're Phil Gaynor. Yeah, and don't reach for a gun bust. I already got one in me mitt. Yes, but you can let it drop to the floor. You heard me. Let it drop. 
Come in, Countess. You see, Race, my ace in the hole turns out to be a queen. Yeah, queen of clubs. What's our next move, Phil? Well, we can't very well take these two with us, can we, darling? And we can't very well have them yapping at our heels when we go. It's really quite simple. We shoot them and get out fast. You take one, I take the other. <clears throat> well, Race, at least we've seen the world. See Bordeaux and die. Is that it, Countess? Let's get it over with, Phil. All right. Ready? Now! It's a good thing I was curious enough to follow you here, Race. Marie Vartel. You will see that the money goes where it should, won't you, Race? Yes, but uh, you're leaving? I think that might be a discreet move on my part, don't you? Uh, you'll stay in Bordeaux? But why? Well, because if you're here, I'll come back. So um, hang around, baby, so I can see you again. The Adventures of Frank Ray, starring Tom Collins with Tony Barrett as Mark Donovan, comes to you from Hollywood. Others heard in tonight's cast were Gene Bates, Gerald Moore, Jack Carrington, Michael Ann Barrett, and Paul Dubon. This series is written and directed by Buckley Angel and Joel Murcott. The music is composed and played by Ivan Ditmars. Be sure to be with us again this time next week for another dramatic chapter in The Adventures of Frank Race. Art Gilmore speaking. This is a Bruce Ells production.